It's one o'clock on Tuesday, the 1st of March, and you are watching Science at Soast. I'm your host, Pete McGuinness Mark, streaming live from beautiful downtown Honolulu. Every week, we bring both graduate students and postdocs doing their research at the School of Ocean, Earth Science and Technology at UH Manoa. And today we've got a really fascinating topic. I know virtually nothing about this, so it's going to be quite an entertaining show. Our guest today is Kelly Trax, who is a graduate student within the Earth Sciences Department uh, of SOST. And so, Kelly, welcome to the show. Delighted to have you on. And apologies in advance if I uh, don't quite understand what you're doing. So oh. why don't we get started? Uh, and, and if you can just briefly describe, you know, where did you do your undergraduate degree or how long have you been a graduate student at Manoa, something like that? Yeah, yeah. Um, I actually have two undergraduate degrees. Um, uh, I, I had to decide what to do in life. Uh, I left one career, started another. And uh, the first career really from Missouri State University really taught me to be really adaptable um, and to build a lot of skill sets. And my professional geology degree I got at Mississippi State University. I then came to UH Manoa in order to get my master's degree. And they successfully got me so interested in my research, I decided to stay and get a PhD um, as well. So I'm very fortunate. Oh. oh, excellent. So you're into the research part of your degree program already? Yeah, so the comps have wrapped up and I've been doing research pretty continuously since I got here. Um, so many exciting things to explore and that I get to share today. That's great. Well, our topic today is detection of contamination in vegetation. And as I said, I know virtually nothing about that. Um, but I think your first slide is going to help the viewers get a, a grasp of what it is you're actually doing. But uh, um, here we see four different types of veggies. Um, can you describe what we're seeing in these uh, four panels here? Yeah, so this is a species that's native to Hawaii. Um, actually, it's it's just a Oahu itself. Mm -hmm. um, it's a moss. They're a really fantastic, robust, resilient, very simple plant species. Um, and mosses are very commonly used for environmental monitoring. Um, so we kind of got up in the, the, the top right section, you can see there's a healthy one, there's a stressed plant, there's one that has low contamination, we would consider this uh, an anthropogenic or a human source of metals that can come from industry, highways, um, dumping, that kind of thing. And then you can see the high contamination. What's really interesting about these photos and what makes the technique that I'm developing really interesting is if there's a high level of stress or a high level of contamination of metals or pollutants, um, then there's an obvious reaction that can be seen in the plant species. Um, but if the contamination is fairly low, but still at a level that would not be safe for the plant or for biota or for humans, it's not necessarily easy to see um, right off the bat. Okay, so for context, I was trying to think before the show, um, you're not trying, for example, to look for sudden ohio death, um, the, the stress that they might be going through. But would the work be of relevance, say, to the Environmental Protection Agency? Um, you're looking at metal contamination in vegetation as opposed to water stress. Um, we actually have moved into looking at environmental stressors. So we consider that drought um, overwatering. So the, the, the stressed plant that we have here actually has a really short photo period. Um, so in Hawaii, we don't have to worry as much about um, long and short day periods seasonally, but other places in the world would. So understanding how that, how different photo periods might affect the plant throughout um, the year is really important to us. Cold, mm -hmm. heat, all of that really matters. And, and, and photo periods is the number of daylight hours? Or? Yes, yes. So okay. in Hawaii, our like sh our shortest day is 11 hours. Our longest is about 15. Um, but in other places in the world, it can be as short as six hours and as long as 20. So. Right. And, and in those images, you had a stressed 
moss mm -hmm. and, and you had one with mild contamination. I, I hope you're going to be able to tell us that uh, with your technique, you can actually discriminate between the two types of uh, um, ill health for the plant. Yes, actually, we, we can. We can tell the difference in photo periods. Um, photo period does seem to have less of an impact overall, which is actually fantastic because um, it means the technique would still work regardless of time of year. But overwatering or drought can have a huge impact um, and excessive nutrients, which would be of interest agriculture, uh, would also uh, really flare up and, and has a very different profile. What's also interesting is the type of contaminant it can also affect the signal that we end up seeing. Okay, and, and so um, this might be related to any agricultural crops here in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, sort of, I, I spent some time in Michigan, for example, where there's a lot of pollution in the uh, groundwater and so forth. Um, hopefully it would be relevant to a whole variety of applications as well as geographic areas. Yeah, we started with mosses because they only collect contamination from the atmosphere. But we've started looking at aquatic species specifically mm -hmm. um, so that we could potentially manage runoff. Um, but we've also looked at what a soil might do. So there are a lot of plants that can be used as bioremediation. So if you have a soil that you know that's contaminated, you could use these plants for bioremediation, use the technique to monitor them, and then remove them before they die and return all those toxic metals back to the soil. And this is a big issue or a small issue in, in Hawaii. Um, obviously, it's easier that the experiment with pretty uniform amount of sunshine each day throughout mm -hmm. the year, it must make your experiments easier. But uh, you know, what's the condition of our, our plants? Are they suffering stress or...? or you know? <laughs> Uh, I Why think, do it here? Yeah, our, our, well, um, one of the major things that we really wanted to look at, but is, is kind of challenging, would be uh, algae. So we get all these algal blooms, um, mm -hmm. which can be incredibly strenuous on an ecosystem. So being able to monitor those and, and see what's a part of it. Um, we also have a lot of our environmental teams that look at uh, cesspools. And this technique would also help by using the vegetation as an indicator. So we could get an early indication of problematic areas and then sample um, very specifically based upon uh, art detection. Which would be really now nice. I see the relevance of your work yeah. in Hawaii with all of the cesspools not only on Oahu, uh, but all the islands, yes. yeah, you, you must have a lot of nutrients going into the soil. So, okay. Now, um, the, the viewers, you'll have to uh, bear with us. I think you're going to introduce some physics to this uh, <laughs> discussion, right, Kelly? So um, let's take a look at the second slide uh, and we'll go into this um, as carefully as we can, right? So yes. what is this? So we're going to keep this things, in my physics textbook. Yes, so. we're, we're going to keep this tremendously simple. So the technique basically has mm. three pieces. One's a light source, one's a sample, and some ways of measuring it. But that means that we really have to understand the fundamentals of light because it's really key to the whole uh, experiment, the research, the process, and the technique. So here is kind of just like a light spectrum. So we're very, very familiar here, especially in Hawaii, with rainbows. And rainbows kind of show the entire spectrum of visible light. Um, what's great about the technique that I'm using is we're fully functioning, working in that, that visible light spectrum. Um, but there's light acts as energy. Um, and that energy can then be imparted into the sample. And this is really what's key. What's important for us is to understand the specific wavelength. So there are shorter wavelengths, which means they're like, they, they, they have a, kind of a higher energy. And then we have slower wavelengths, which have a lower energy. Um, and so understanding that we need to input a higher energy um, to a sample and then watching that output come out is, is, is really important. And the colors are actually what help us in our technique uh, see what that energy loss is and also classify what we're looking at. And some of the viewers 
may have heard of the term the electromagnetic spectrum and i think that that's what you're showing so yes. you know the, the astronomers on Mauna Kea would make their measurements or um you know if you go to a dentist and have an x-ray yeah, x-ray uh, uh yeah, right, right 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 like yeah your microwave there's they're all on this spectrum of, of things okay. but we're working in just kind of the visible and, and we've had um, other guests have come on to look at, say, uh, the colors of minerals, for example, in reflected light. Mm -hmm. A lot of the planetary community will look at the, the spectral characteristics. Yes. You're doing yes. something different. Yeah, right? yeah. I think, I think your third slide is going to sort of uh, introduce us to, to how, how you do your studies. Yeah, so this this right here is kind of the fundamental part. So whenever mm -hmm. you have any kind of particle, an atom, a sample, uh, it could be a human being, it could be your hand. So uh, we have a particular wavelength of light. In this case, it's blue. We're just going to keep it simple. It's blue light. Um, and we can shoot that light at, say, your hand. In our case, we're shooting it at a plant, the moss, and it goes in. Uh, it gets absorbed by the plant for photosynthetic processes. But it's really interesting is it energizes the plant. It's all this energy and there's a little energy transfer. And so the energy absorbed and the rest of it gets released. And so we can measure um, the light that is emitted from our source, from our light, and then we can also measure what gets emitted. And then um, you can see in the, the figure on the, the right hand side, you see that there's kind of a shift in the wavelength based upon color, but we also have a reduction in the amount of energy that we see. But you're using lasers, right? This isn't just a regular light bulb which covers a wide spectrum. Yes, yes, yes. Well, tell us about about lasers that you use. Yeah, yeah. To to be fair, um, this is a very broad field, and there are people who use the sun because the sun is our huge, ginormous, powerful light bulb um, of sorts, and it has all spectrums of colors. The difficulty is that if you use a specific wavelength, a very specific color. Um, then you also can very specifically know what the output is. So we use a lot of different lasers. We have a green one and we have a blue one. And we even have one that's UV. Um, some of these are super high powered and some of them are as powerful as a laser pointer. Um, it doesn't take a whole lot of energy uh, to, to do the technique, which is really fantastic. Um, we mostly work with blues uh, because of the specific pigment that chlorophyll is in plants. That's really why plants are fantastic for this technique is because they naturally fluoresce. Um, all we have to do is give them an input. And this fluorescence is um, the, the energy coming off after you've shone the, the laser beam does this happen instantly or the following week or, or what's the time period? <laughs> so to be clear, um, there's you may have heard of uh, like photoluminescence. Mm -hmm. um, so there's phosphorescence and there's fluorescence. Fluorescence is often so short our naked eye can't see it. Um, but phosphorescence will be for like seconds. Uh, can last for a very long time. Uh, we aren't interested in that the long lifespan. We're inter interested in the short, which actually allows us if we use a time gating. So if we say, hey, I only want my detector to measure in like 0.1 second, then my detector actually is, is taking an image so quickly it can't even see sunlight. OK. At, but the fluorescence is such a short lifetime, especially for biologic material like chlorophyll, that we do capture that. I see. All right. And, and is this similar? And when we go to like the Bishop Museum and they shine a UV light on some minerals, for example, and they turn lovely colors, is that the same sort of thing if the viewers are trying to understand what you're? It is, yes. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, it will depend on the length of time. That's really how For you sure. define yeah. fluorescence. But yes, that's that's a major concern when choosing the color of your laser um, and what time frame that you're you're detecting the signal back at in order to to what we would say distinguish between a biologic and an uh, an inorganic object so a rock versus a plant both might fluoresce and so we have to be very careful um, with what we're using and i think you're going to show us in the fourth slide that not all vegetation fluoresce at the same wavelengths um if we go on to the the fourth slide yes uh it again, gets even, explain this to us yes it gets even <laughs> more complicated than that so um many plants have both chlorophyll a and chlorophyll b but there are also plants that don't have any chlorophyll b at all it's just an evolutionary the quirk that certain plants have and others don't. Um, so there on the bottom, you can kind of see this spread of wavelengths. You can think of blue being on the left and red being on the right hand side and you're moving yeah. across the light spectrum. And what it's basically showing on the, the right on the left hand side is uh, the absorption bands. So if we were to emit a light, these are the maximum points at which chlorophyll A or chlorophyll B will absorb that light. And what we want to do is try and hit these maximum peaks. So the highest points of these are where we would want to shine a laser so that we can get the maximum output of fluorescence. So input as much energy as possible to get as much energy out so that we can measure it. And those peaks or those wavelengths are where you tune your lasers to again increase the signal to noise. Yes, yeah. Right. And we can make the laser specific. So we've started working on a technique where one of our lasers focuses on chlorophyll A and the other one focuses on chlorophyll B. The reason for that is because each plant has a specific ratio. It could actually help us monitor if the plant is being stressed and if there are changes between those two, but it could also help us differentiate between vegetation. Uh, you said that we're trying to tune the lasers. You do this at SOST uh, at your h or do you just go and buy a different laser and um, put it in your equipment? Uh, both. both. <laughs> that is a both. That's impressive. So, so, so usually lasers have kind of a range. And so mm -hmm. there is a little bit of uh, tuning, as it were, to kind of right. get it within the range that you want. Um, but it's far easier to, especially if you just need a low power laser. So a lot of times we'll just buy a really low power unit to test. And then if we need something with bigger energy, then that's that's something or more intensity. That's something we can now tell us a bit more about the experiments. And I think in slide five, you show us a little bit on how you actually do this. Uh, yes, it's not clear so, if that's you in the pictures, but walk us through this one. Yes, so this is a, a great way of showing you what the sample naturally looks like versus what it looks like when it fluoresces. So we take a sample and we give it maybe a metal solution, maybe a nutrient solution. Sometimes we just give it water um, because metabolic processes in the mosses start immediately once they have uh, uh, water added to them. Um, once we've done that, we'll put it underneath the laser and use a computer in order to control the detector. And then, so we can get the timing resolution the same. And so we'll fire the laser at it and then just capture an image. So the, the light source goes in, gives us the excitation. It, uh, interacts with the sample, which you can see in the uh, picture in the top right. And we get that red fluorescence naturally back and capture that image. So it's not a point of laser light. You can actually get an image from a, a small area of the plant. Um, we can actually back up pretty far. Uh, in uh -huh. our case, we don't want to start getting uh, extra input from things that aren't the sample. So right. plastics can be very reactive, um, unfortunately, and they'll fluoresce really bright blue and it can be really problematic. Um, so we, we kind of try and keep it in focus, but that sample right there is about four inches by six inches. Okay. Okay. Kind of like a postcard size. And, and your lasers maybe how many feet or inches away from the target 
Um, that particular setup is about half a meter, um, okay. but another mm -hmm. team has had success up to uh, uh, five meters or about 15 feet. Wow. And, and what do the results look like? Is that in uh, slide six? Um, so the results we actually, so we take pictures of all yeah. of this, uh, and then we process those pictures. So uh, the top image is showing you a control or a perfectly healthy, nothing has been done to it except water been added moss sample. And the bottom picture is showing you uh, what happens to the moss's level of fluorescence after a tremendous amount of copper has been added, um, what would be really detrimental to plants and humans alike. Um, and so what we do is in this image, so every, every picture you take, even if you just are on vacation or you go out to the beach, Every picture you take is made up of millions of teeny tiny pixels, and each pixel has a little coding. So it has a red code and a blue code and a green code. And so we can go in and for every single pixel, we can pick out all of those codes and then we can add them all together and count them. And we can create a profile from that or uh, in our case, we would call that a histogram. So we did that for both images. And what you end up seeing is this really stark contrast between the control and between the contaminated uh, specimen. So we have this huge shift in, in that bottom plot, um, showing this darkening, this deep red coloration that starts to really take over. And can you correlate the, that sharpening or the trend towards the darker pixels um, does that correlate directly with the amount of contaminant or the duration they're stressed or different types of stress? It does. So we ran an experiment uh, over 10 days giving incremental doses at mm -hmm. very different levels. And we found that regardless of a single massive dose or a bunch of tiny doses that uh, accumulated to the same level, there was a, a trend that we found um, in 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 the response of the moss and we we can see it just slowly shift over to the side um as we're going okay okay uh, and you know all of this work is being done in the laboratory right now um it, it, is it going to be relatively easy to take it out into the field or so um, the one unit that we use has a cart but it has to have <laughs> pretty pretty much you have to plug it into a pretty powerful source. Um, okay. the, the chlorophyll specific unit that I've been working with more recently for my PhD, um, we're actually already in the phases of trying to test it portable. Um, our biggest challenge has been uh, just getting like a portable power bank that we can run off of so we can keep the laser going. But we've successfully used a, a cell phone camera instead of something mm -hmm. more expensive, just whatever junk you have lying around mm -hmm. but we know the camera still works too we, we've got a, a really fancy tablet that we can try out as well our biggest question is uh light intensity so we can do uh maybe early morning late evening but at noon because of the limited power of our current uh baby laser as i would call it mm -hmm. um okay. we'd be limited on time Okay. What, what do you envisage, uh, say, a farmer up in Haliva being, would she be able to use this sort of thing if she was growing different crops to try and figure out what the degree of contamination or water stress were? Highly plausible. Um, um, it would be really important to know what a good sample looks like versus a bad uh -huh. sample. Um, so that we have okay. some kind of benchmark to work from to make sure that our measurements are accurate. Um, it would also be important to compare different vegetation types. The other thing about making the unit portable is we want it to be a remote system that could be attached to a drone. So um, testing in the field is really important so that we can start using maybe that five meter uh, elevation to pass over a sample uh, and just constantly do, do sampling in real time. Well, I presume that the power uh, supply would be quite a challenge for a drone, which itself has limited flight duration and things yes, like yeah. that. Yes, yeah. It, it, it really comes down to the laser intensity. So the less intensity that the or less energy that it requires, the less battery that we would need. Uh, sure. The camera is also a big question mark too, but a lot of drones come with a camera that's already mounted. So it's really just making sure that the laser and the camera are properly aligned. Okay, so where do you see this research going, Kelly? I mean, is it 
something that could be uh, commercialized or is this primarily a research tool? Um, I think commercial is highly plausible. I mean, I'm a one person <laughs> kind of unit. Right. Um, sure. but, but the main goal was that right now in order to do wide sampling is often very labor intensive. Or we, we've had national labs come to us and say that the, the infrared units that they have are destructive. And they would really like to be able to go back to the exact same leaf and know that it hasn't been damaged by the technique so that they can really monitor the health of it without, without having impact or being affected by time of day. Um, and, and there are limitations to satellite imagery. It's good, but there are limitations to being able to be specific on the ground. So we, there's certainly room for it for the technique. I think it's important to just tell the viewers that the lasers you're using aren't like these Death Star lasers. These oh, are gosh, no, no, li like, literally, yeah, literally, <laughs> literally, literally a, like a, a laser pointer. Um, yeah. We have looked yeah. into UV because it's eye safe, which would mm -hmm. be really important if, if we were running it over, right. over top of something just yeah. for public safety. Right. So we've got about two minutes left. Can you tell us a little bit, what else are you doing? This sounds to be a, a, a great topic for a graduate student. Uh, you've got in slide eight, you've got, I think, three different projects going. What, what oh, else my goodness. Are you um, there is there's certainly no shortage of things. So on the uh, left hand side, we've been trying to uh, most of our images have been moss masses. We're trying to get a little bit smaller. That way, if we were wanting to pinpoint sample, we would know that an individual sample that we collected is contaminated and is good representation for chemical analysis. Um, we are also comparing it to a more traditional check which is spectrophotometry, which is basically where you completely dissolve the sample so that you can get a pure pigment measurement. And we want to make sure that our chlorophyll A, B measurements are really matching up there. Um, on the right-hand side, we have two invasive species, so nobody cares what we do to them, um, duckweed and azola. Um, and and they're, they basically float on the top of surfaces. So the azola actually can be found, uh, because it's fantastic at nutrient cycling, can be found in taro ponds. Kelly, I'm afraid I'm going to have to stop you. There's too much to talk about. <laughs> yeah. So we'll have to invite you back uh, some other time. But let me just remind the viewers, you have been watching Science at Soast. I'm your host, Pete McGinnis-Mark. And today we had a fascinating discussion from Kelly Truex about using lasers to look at contamination in vegetation. So Kelly, thank you very much for being on the show. I learned an awful lot this time, so thank you, and please come back sometime. And so we'll see you again all next week at the same time. So for now, goodbye. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.